Over 7 million different animals inhabit our planet. What do I have in common with a female killer whale and a female short fin pilot? What can they teach us? And everything that they've been studying, scientists are saying this is evidence of culture. That not only... Many species are in crisis and need your help. Join the movement at allcreaturespod.com. Welcome to All Creatures Podcast. This is Chris. And I'm Angie. Part two of Orcas, Angie. This is the, this is, I mean, the first part was awesome. So please, if you haven't listened, go back and listen to part one. So part two makes more sense. But part two, or you can just go in part two and hopefully you pick it up. But part two, oh my God, I'm so excited to talk about this stuff. I'm so excited about talking about this stuff. Yeah, like you said, we're going to be hitting the big ones. We're going to be talking about behavior, mm-hmm. hunting strategies, and behavior with that, culture. It's going to be a behavior with that. reproduction. <laughs> it's orca behavior 101. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, and then, well, and of course we're going to talk a lot. Of, some other stuff. Yeah. yeah we're, we're going to talk a lot about reproduction because I can't control myself. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. also we'll talk a lot about conservation, but yeah. And if you stick with us towards the end, you're going to learn some really fun cocktail party facts that have to do with humans. So women, me, for mm-hmm. instance, what do I have in common with a female killer whale and a female short fin pilot whale? Us you three have something have in common. <laughs> no, I tiny. Well, you, okay, I'll wait. But no, I'll wait, but I'll wait. The, something that we share. Us three share okay. uh, those three species. Humans, besides female reproductive anatomy, or any of that stuff, or you have, okay, okay, got it, got it. Something we're the only, happens, we're, right? th- th- we're three exceptions compared to all other mammals that we know. Oh, about. okay. There you go. Okay. 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 Well, I'm, oh, I'm on my seat. <laughs> so, and then just quickly, hopefully you, you enjoyed the interview with Dr. Rob Hilsenroth. It was oh, such a pleasure to sit down and talk to him about animal conservation, veterinarians, the work and research they're doing that, you know, throughout the United States and the world with the AAZV. So if you haven't heard that, please go back and listen to it. It just was amazing. And I have to thank the other Julie that I've been talking to quite a bit lately down in Florida who helped arrange all that. It was amazing that she could do that for us, you know, so, so thank you and shout out to her. Really quickly, you know, check us out on Patreon. We release the Great White Shark episode as the backup to this one. So we, like we said in the first one, we just could not paywall this. We couldn't, couldn't, couldn't. I couldn't do it in good and conscious. I, I want this for the general listenership, but you know, if you, if you're so kind, you know, give, you know, minimum five bucks a month gets you extra episodes, extra content, polls. The Fox poll is up, so voting on which Fox we're going to cover, things like that. And it helps Angie and I keep the podcast running. And we actually do want to upgrade our equipment so we sound even better. So, uh, Angie, just some facts before I jump into a nerd out on echolocation. <laughs> so, just, <laughs> just to recap what we know so far. There are 10 different possible subspecies of orca throughout the, throughout the world, northern hemisphere. Northern and Southern Hemisphere, they all have different diets, which we're going to get into here in a minute. Some of the things that they do share is generally these whales, but we know they're not really whales because Angie's so smart and educated us that they're actually dolphins, but we're still going to call them whales. They don't dive that deep, you know, compared to an elephant seal. Like, seriously, (laughs) I still can't believe how deep elephant seals go. My goodness, yeah. Oh. I remember you, yeah. we had to and fact to check hours. that one. We were yeah. like, what? That yeah. can't be right. That was There's a typo. No that can't be right. And it was, yeah. Yeah. That's how they get get away from killer whales. I'll tell you that much. Seriously. Um, no, nah, I don't know. But I'd probably, they just dive deep. So generally, uh, orcas dive about 100 meters or 328 feet deep, which isn't that deep, you know, for a whale or a dolphin, I guess. Uh, but they can swim up to 45 kilometers per hour or 28 miles per hour. So they're quick. We know that, you know, they're, they're, they're pretty quick. So do you think sound travels faster through air or water? Oh, uh, or in a vacuum. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Does sound even travel in a vacuum? I don't think so. 
<laughs> I know. I feel like I know the answer to this. I feel like I'm going to get it wrong. Yeah. So, no. Oh. I think air. The less res- yeah, less resistance yeah. in air, okay. right? There's less resistance yeah, in air. I felt, it was like a, I felt like it was a trick question. Oh, I'm wrong? You're wrong. Oh. You're wrong. It is a trick question. You were absolutely 100% wrong. Well, that's the first time that's ever happened, Chris. <laughs> yeah, let me, I don't I'll even know how to feel her. right <laughs> now. I don't... I don't even know. Listen to this. Who am I? I didn't know. Look, who I'm a, am I? Take. I did not know this. Take my doctor away. Just, just, just get the dr out of my name. <laughs> You're not a physicist. I know. I'm teasing. You're not a physicist. Ain't nobody so taking that doctor away cannot, from me. Uh, uh-uh, uh. No. <laughs> listen to this. Sound travels faster in water. Can you believe that? No, I'm really thinking about it now, and I'm trying to figure. Uh, I guess I should have okay. paid more attention to my physics class. Four and a half times faster. Okay, now water. you just blew my mind. I, it travels at a speed of one and a half kilometers a second or almost one mile per second. How? I said, why? Okay. Let me, let me, let me, let me give you the physics behind it. In water. Don't go too deep. Don't scare new listeners away. No, <laughs> no, no, no. It's really quick. The particles, water particles are much closer together. Okay. So you're right. In the air, there's not, you know, we, we live in a gas atmosphere. We just don't see it, you know, and, and really feel it unless you really like wave your hand or you feel your car driving down the road, you stick your hand out the window. You're feeling that resistance. That is all the gas in the atmosphere. In water, the particles are so close together that sound waves vibrate those particles. So they travel four times faster. I was like, what? Hmm. It's insane. Well, I know that water's held. But, I know that water's held together by yeah. hydrogen bonds, like two water molecules. Mm-hmm. Inside of water, inside an H two O, it's a pol- polar covalent bond. I just had to teach this last week. It's a polar covalent bond. Oh, so now who's getting nerdy? I know. Sorry. No, I'm trying to figure <laughs> this out. Who's trying to listen but, to I, but I was yeah. drawing it out for so, the students, yeah. and I'm like, but when wa- when yeah. two water molecules are connected, which is obviously in a body of water. Mm-hmm. It's a hydrogen bond that can that links the chain waters together. So I, I guess I didn't think of them as being more tightly packed, but now that is right. making some sense to me. Uh, but I will say, okay, it takes a lot of energy to start that vibration. Okay, so like when you're underwater and you make noise, like I was just thinking, we play about, that like, game. You know, yeah, if you can understand me jump. underwater, yeah, uh-huh. yeah. Yeah, the the sound waves travel there faster, but obviously it's not quite as loud than say above, right? Because it needs more. You need more energy to produce a, a very loud sound. Okay. All right. So where where I'm going with that? Well, really quick. What happens in ice? <laughs> I'm just messing with you. <laughs> Moving on. So the <laughs> I'm, I'm not going there. So these whales and and dolphins really that can echolocate. Right, because as we had men- we had mentioned in the previous pod, yeah. like the baleen mm-hmm. whales don't use echolocation. No, no, but these ones do. These these oceanic dolphins or oceanic whales. So they have a a structure called the dorsal bursa, and that's where they produce sound. Sometimes they call them monkey lips. I guess it kind of looks like lips or phonic lips um, that projects into their nasal passages. So what the whale basically does in these nasal sacs is produce the energy, the vibration, and that melon that's in the the forefront of their head projects that out and they have sound waves. Now those sound waves, the way echolocation works, it's like if, if, I don't know if anybody, I mean, you know me, I'm nerdy. No submarines, the pinging of a submarine, you go ping, and then when it hits something, it pings back. Okay. That's how they tell where there's an object. So if you ping and it never comes back, then it, there's nothing there. If you ping and then it comes back, it's distance. And if you ping, ping, it comes right back right away. That means there's something close, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So those sound waves. So the, the returning sound waves, the – I want to laugh about doing that pinging. No, the you sound waves really great. Actually, yeah, I'm like, he's got some, okay. he's got some chops, some harmony. <laughs> I kind of wanted to harmonize. Okay. Ah, <laughs> ah, That's ah, ping. Ah. Right. So they have a lot talking about uh, if last uh, last pod we were talking about fat cells in ten years. So there's a lot of fat cells or a lot of fat in their jaw. Okay. They get that vibration back, and then like their ear bones right behind that, and then they can feel that that vibration. So that's how they echolocate, and it's really important for them not only hunting. 
but also navigation. So navigating in murky water right. around they use it. Obviously, they you're going to get into vocalizations. They use a lot of that for communicating to uh, all their different vocalizations. And so they, they do that to echolocate. I just thought it was fascinating that, you know, that that's how they, you know, get around because I mean, you think about their eyesight too, which is, isn't spectacular. And plus the eyes is more mono, you know, monocular vision on the side of their head. So right. they're depending on, it's like, you know, bats and some of these other species that use echolocation. Now, as far as predators that might prey on orcas, Forget is about actually it. the total sum of zero. <laughs> As I say, forget <laughs> Except, about humans. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Humans are the only thing that is uh, pr- that will prey on these uh, orcas. Still around the world, uh, people are killing orcas, especially fishermen. You know, in other countries, maybe even here in the United States or in Canada, it's illegal, but they may do it because they think that the whales are in competition for them. Um, plus we're contaminating the ocean like nobody's business, which we're going to get to at the end a little bit. So we're definitely a big threat to them. Now, being that we just covered great white sharks and we talked a little bit about killer whales killing great white sharks, this here's, here's a nerdy, really cool thing about it. And, and I just saw another article come by in South Africa where these great whites are washing up with Totally intact, except what do you think the the whales love to eat? Liver mm-hmm. and tongue. Oh, it's because you knew. You're right. Liver <laughs> is a big one, and you I, know that. I, I watched I, a I lot of videos one. this past week. <laughs> okay, sorry. So I did, did, there's a study, but it's it's I, mean, it, I know it's I mentioned crazy, this though. I mean, if you really, if you're, yeah, it, it sounds is. like That's what all they eat. They like, like liver pate. Yeah, oh, nope, I only want yeah. this. I don't want that. Yeah. Yeah. The loin. Um, and I know we talked about in the great white episode, but again, I want to recap it here that I saw this documentary that they're studying great white sharks off the Fairland islands off San Francisco, which I lived last century, uh, for a couple of years. And you saw the islands way off the golden gate bridge. And there's, there's a pretty sizable population of great whites. We talked about in the elephant seal episode too, they like to hang out there. Well, one year this pod, of killer whales comes through and kills a great white and eats the liver. And that's it. The researchers had a bunch of sharks tagged. What they noticed was within that day, somehow the great whites knew one, and they think it's, it's smell. Uh, one was killed. They all dove super deep, all the great white sharks and they fled and they all evacuated the Farallon islands. Hmm. They didn't come back for a year. Some of them didn't come back for over a year. Wow. And that was their major feeding grounds. They bolted because they knew killer whales were in the area or something killed a great white shark. So I thought it was really cool. They were, they were also talking about using it as like shark repellent. What was it? What chemical was released? That's what they were trying to study, but it was like the most amazing thing ever. So they're definitely kings of the sea, you know, uh, great whites. Nope. Nope. Nothing. Nothing can, can, harass or injure or kill a killer whale except us. All right. So getting to nutrition, Angie, so we can work out on behavior. We covered this in the first part, but you know, it depends on the pod type, you know, they, they seals off beaches, penguins off icebergs, blue whales, minke whales, narwhals, fish, sharks, you name it. Octopus probably. Sorry, Warren, you know, Yes. Yeah, over 140 different species of animals, squids, birds that they will eat. Um, but again, it's going to depend on the, the the type that we talked about of those 10 types. And then like you said, they hunt like a pack of wolves, right? Sure. They're social hunters. So like lions or wolves and they hunt in pack and they use very complex coordinated social behaviors and communication to hunt prey larger than themselves sometimes, such as, such as whales or or small, tiny prey such as fish, but putting them all together to make it worth their while. So it just is, their feeding habits to me are just phenomenal. And I had a lot of fun a few weeks ago preparing for Painted Dogs, uh, the African Painted Dog, that podcast, and just trying to wrap my head around 
these uh, complex behaviors. So cool. Oh, oh my goodness. And, and so as Chris previously mentioned, echolocation is a huge part of locating prey. And, but once prey has been located, that's where the magic starts to happen. In my opinion, uh, I was able to find a really nice summary of hunting behaviors and you'll have to bear with me. And in, in, in episode one, we had to bear with Chris going through his 10 different populations. I know, I know. <laughs> oh, so, so cool. cool. So there, there will be no bearing. Yeah. But the you, hunting you behaviors, yeah. Each one. I think there's yeah. like six of them. But yeah, and we'll put the notes on yeah. our, we'll put the webpage on our show notes. It's from up, from a nature documentary on PBS and beautiful, concise website. But then they also have video of the individual behaviors. So if you're really in a mood to be kind of, I guess, uh, amazed and horrified and amazed all in the, all in the same roller coaster ride of emotions, yeah. uh, check out, check out our show notes that we'll link you to that. But one of the first ones that got my attention, uh, Chris hinted to a little bit in episode one of Orcas, but it's called the wave wash. And this is, mm -hmm. this prey is usually for seals. And so these are going to be for the orcas that are living around the Antarctic ice shelf. And what seals will do is they'll perch themselves on ice floats to stay out of the water, right? Like if there's a major apex predator mm -hmm. in the water, you stay out of the water. Well, however, the killer whales have devised a way to dump the seals into the water. And basically what they do is they'll charge the floats of ice in formation. So this is multiple family members working together. This isn't just, this is not mm -hmm. just one mm -hmm. killer whale. This is multiple family members. And they basically get in tight formation and create a huge wave. Just be, and just before reaching the ice, they dive underneath and push one more time with their tails really hard basically making all the water crash over the ice float and there goes the seal in the water. It can't, it can't stay on the ice float down, down it goes. And there's their dinner. Think about that. Okay. Think about that's what that's okay. And this is where we start. That's the wave the wash. Number one. <laughs> that's number one. That's number one. This is, and, and we talked about African wild dogs or painted dogs a couple weeks ago their behavior, their hunting strategies. Okay. And this is, that's the specialized group and that's the type B large type of orca that has developed that strategy mm -hmm. and then passed it on from generation to generation to generation. Okay. So think about that. That is a complex hunting behavior. All right. Cor Go on, yeah, Dr. Coordinate. And I, I, yes. I still can't get past one coordinating it all together in the yeah. water. I was on the swim yeah. team and we couldn't coordinate hardly anything. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's like, what was that? Synchronized swimming. Yeah, I mean, synchronized my swimming. My mom did that. That's what they were doing. Heart. That's exactly what they're doing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's what they're doing. Uh, yeah. But I just, incredible, right? And so, uh, number two, Chris already talked a little bit about this, I think just a few minutes ago on sharks. So this move is called the karate chop. <laughs> and as Chris kind of alluded to, this works on sharks, even great white sharks, which is risky business. That's risky. Okay. Yeah. Tons of sharp teeth. They can easily pierce their hide. So it's still not a problem for orcas. What they do is they use their broad tail to create a vortex almost underneath the shark to help push the shark up to the surface. Mm -hmm. And then one of them will raise their tail or turn and raise their tail slightly high into the air and basically do a tail slap crashing down onto the shark's head. <laughs> to disorient it, right? Well, yeah, yeah. basically. Yeah. Definitely disorients it, probably hurts it. Mm -hmm. But then the orca will flip the shark over. Okay. Mm -hmm. After karate chops, it, it flips it over yeah. and that basically sends the shark into a stupor that the scientists have termed tonic immobility. 
Yeah, they've done it. I've seen, I've seen, uh, I wouldn't recommend this, but I've actually seen people like in Shark Week and all that where they actually do that, where they touch them on the nose and like disorient them and turn them upside down. And it's insane. It's insane. It's insane. And so when the sharks are in this tonic immobility phase, they're basically more or less paralyzed. I don't know if that's the right terminology, mm-hmm. but they're out of and it. Then, yeah, they're out of it. Yeah, they just they start dining right then and there. And some researchers have gone as far to say it's almost like the orcas know the biology that 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 this mm-hmm. is a phenomenon that will happen with sharks when they're bopped on the head and then turned upside down. I don't know who wouldn't be disoriented if they're tail bat karate chopped on the head and then turned upside down. Yeah, and I, and I don't. It might be some more of the fish specialists that could be the resident orcas. Um, I couldn't find specifically which type hunt sharks, but probably one of the more fish or generalist eaters probably do. Yeah, and so well, speaking of fish, we'll move on to hunting strategy number three, called the carousel. And so this is usually for smaller fish, such as herrings, and of course they could chase down individual fish and just gobble up one at a time, but that's not worth the effort. What, what's the old saying? Work smart, not hard. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, so not harder, yep. yeah. So orcas, uh, living off of the Norwegian coast figured out that if they work together, they can use a combination of belly flashes and air bubbles to basically herd schools into a tighter ball near the surface of the water. It turns into basically what they call a churning bait ball, which resembles a carousel. That's where this name comes from. And then the orcas slap the ball with their tails, stunning the fish. Slap, 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 slap. Like, think about a carousel if you just start knocking people off of it. (laughs) (laughs) It's food, dinner. (laughs) And after doing this stunning with the tail slap, it makes them... Much easier, these smaller fish, much easier to eat a whole bunch at one time instead of just one. Because instead of one swimming far away from you, you have like 15 of them, yeah, Mm -hmm. flapping around. Stunned, stunned, basically. Stunned, yeah. Okay? Yeah, yeah. So that's probably the North Atlantic type one. That's probably that behavior. Okay. So, Chris, now it comes to one of our favorites. I I think I know which one you're going to do. I wanted to do this one, but you do it. You do it. Yeah, this is this this move, this hunting strategy for orcas works on the narwhal. Oh no, I didn't do that one. So okay, no. <laughs> for all you narwhal fans out there, which if you listen to our podcast, a lot of them, it's one of our top most downloaded, downloaded yeah. episodes. So yes, this is called the pod pen. Oh no! And there is it's in part of a nature episode called Invasion of the Killer Whales, and this hunting strategy hadn't been documented prior to this. And so of course I watched the video we'll put on our show notes. Uh, and, and researchers aren't sure if it's just the first time they're documented it or if narw- narwhals are moving a little further South to look for more food. And then therefore they're crossing the orcas path. So they're not really sure, but basically what the video shows is a large pod of killer whales chasing down an entire pod of narwhal. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, Let's, for those of you not familiar or ha- that haven't listened to the episode, I mean, narwhals have that yeah, tusk, tooth, a long tooth, the yeah, tusk long tooth. tooth. Yeah. And so they have like theoretically a weapon. If they all stay in, if they all stay together, they could maybe fight him off. Nope. Basically the, uh, the killer whales push them into shallow water and just keep pushing until they isolate a few. Into shallow and shallow and shallower water, mm-hmm. and then snack time. Dinner time, yeah. Okay, okay. Mm-hmm. Let's see if you cover the one I I I, I looked at. So that's okay. probably yeah. I mean, you're looking. I mean, the the I don't, I don't know who that would be. I know they said the. the well, it's got to be the one of the more northern bigs, ones. Yeah, the bigs or the offshore. You know, the, they still don't know in the offshore very much what they eat, but the bigs definitely goes after whales. So. And then also the um, North Atlantic Type 2. So you have one in the Pacific, one in the Atlantic that goes after. Because remember, folks, the narwhal is only in the Arctic. So Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. And this is another video that I watched that had a good ending. But it was 
it was pulling at my heartstrings, man. Mm -hmm. Uh, this one's called the blow hole block and this works Mm -hmm. on larger whales. Yeah. Like the blue whale. I know. Uh, and obviously it wouldn't be mama blue whale, but it'd be calf. Mm -hmm. And once again, this is, um, a pod of orcas working together and they basically take turns ramming, biting, and pulling on the whale's pectoral fins Mm -hmm. for hours. Yeah. Upon hours, upon hours. Snacking, snacking. Well, they basically, yeah, and basically just wear it down. Wear it down, yeah. They'll even do moves. This is where the blowhole block comes into. And how they coordinate this, Chris, it's Mm. it's back to the... Intelligence, painted dog yeah. situation. Yeah, I know, I know. Uh, who, how they decide who's doing what, but while this is going on, one of them will launch from the water onto the whale's back, trying to prevent the blowhole from reaching. Basically, are you kidding me? I didn't think. I, I thought it was because I remember this National Geographic thing where they showed them blocking underneath so it couldn't dive, and this was a bigger blue whale that they were stripping blubber off so you're telling me they jump on the back of the whale so it can't breathe yes because it's Holy once again smokes. it's like they know the biology wow. that marine oh, wow. mammals have to breathe right wow they have, wow. To, they have wow. to come so they'll try to keep it under to but not too far under right because they don't right. want to get away from them and yeah, to partip- and and basically between trying to drown it and then go after oh. it for hours. So the video that's posted on this um, nature PBS link that we'll put up there, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, two hours they were going after this whale calf. That's insane. That's insane. Now, of course, the video is shortened, and so yeah. it's, it's, uh, yeah. it's not two hours. Yeah. But yeah, um, they uh, this in the in the in spoiler alert if you mm. in the episode. The mama whale was, she was not having none of it. Two yeah. hours, she fought this pod off and she, they were, they swam off. Uh, finally, finally, the, gave up. the pod gave up. Yep. The killer whales wow. gave up. And wow. so they, the people documenting, documenting it think that the, the baby was, the calf was probably, hopefully okay. Okay. Definitely rattled, exhausted, yeah. probably yeah. made it. Um, so. Yeah. Ooh, that's wow. crazy. Wow. Happy times, okay. right? Okay. Okay. <laughs> now, I don't know which one that would be one of the, one of the, uh, transient ones that that's probably out. In the, yeah. The ocean. Well, yeah. Yeah. Going after, going after larger whales. Like that's yeah. crazy. Okay. Yeah. And so the last one that I have, and we'll see if it's one of the ones that you have, yeah. but the one, this one, um, uh, nature calls the D day. It also known as storming yeah. the beach. Yes. This is yes. what I was going to cover. <laughs> Oh, good. Okay. This one yeah, works okay, on good. sea lions and elephant seals. We covered yeah. elephant seals already. Yeah. So yeah. Do you want to, do you want to chime in on what you well, have? Yeah. So one? yeah, what I did, what I read. Okay. So Southern hemisphere, this is off Argentina. I couldn't nail which type I looked and looked and looked and I couldn't figure out which type it was. I think it was maybe the type B, the smaller ones, just they, they do eat some seals or things like that. Or I don't know. It could be the type B big ones. But basically, okay, so what this is particularly sea lions, and we know the southern elephant seal uh, down there in the southern hemisphere too. Another awesome episode, if you haven't heard that one, that one was amazing. So the baby seals play in the surf close to the beach. And these are very young, and they're just, they're, they're ignorant to danger. They just don't understand. You know, they're, they're too young. It's like, you know, any kid. I mean, it makes, it pulls your heartstrings, but this hunting strategy is insane. So even the seal moms don't warn them, hey, get away from that, right? They just, oh, no, you know, I guess I'll come back next year. So they have these channels off the beach, and this has been documented on on some of these nature shows. And so the orcas are not targeting the larger seals because their success rate is about 20% on a large seal off the beach where the younger ones is about 50, 50 chance of catching a young seal. Right. So, and, and you can help me, but they're, they're echolocation. So they, they know when, what, where these channels are. The video I remember seeing years ago, the mom was teaching the younger whale where to go and how to do it. And so they go up to one of these channels when there's, there's 
a, a baby sea lion in there and then they grab it and then they pull it out mm-hmm. to see the, the video I saw, they were actually letting the seal swim a little bit. That's where you saw them flip it in the air and playing with it, playing with their food, showing junior how to, to do that. It's just how they, this specific hunting strategy, again, they put their lives in danger and there have been some strandings sure, where they beached themselves. I mean, that's yes. crazy. Yeah. And then they wait for the surf to come back in and then they just back up with a seal in its mouth. Yeah. They do like a little hopping motion, uh, which that's... we've all done when we're playing in the ocean, but that's like you said, oh. risking. That's just, Oh my goodness. And this that's... is a different subspecies slash eco type eco type ecotype yeah. of killer whale. They all don't do this. Just this specific ecotype does this. Like you tell me, you tell me how intelligent these animals are. Oh my goodness. Just, I know. I, I, I think and we're, we're just at the forefront of understanding how intelligent they are uh, well, and what they can do. And before we get into what we can learn from them and learn yeah. about them, uh, And maybe before we get into, you know, I know you have a lot more on behavior as far as communication and then jumping into reproduction, right? Mm -hmm. Good point to kind of talk about culture. So all of these hunting strategies and everything that they've been studying, scientists are saying this is evidence of culture that not only do these each ecotypes have distinct dialects, but even specific pods have, they think, speak a little bit differently, right? I think you were saying that um, earlier. And really, the evidence, there's really two lines of evidence that indicate that these are learned behaviors. Now, to give you some definitions of culture, I had to kind of research this a little bit, and I actually found it at my alma mater, Texas A&M, uh, where they talk about culture and some definitions. So not to go too much into all of these, but the one that really doesn't apply to whales, I wouldn't think, is culture refers to the deposit of knowledge, experience, beliefs, values, attitudes, meanings, hierarchies. That pretty much applies to whales. But then it, then they put in religion, notions of time, maybe whales, roles, spatial relationships, concepts of the universe. Maybe. You don't know. Whales might be thinking right? about the universe. I don't know. Possessions. I don't know. I don't know. That didn't really apply really too much. This, and they had a bunch of different definitions for culture. This one I thought just absolutely yes. Culture in its broadest sense is cultivated behavior that is the totality of a, they put person, but I would say entity, whatever, animal, learned, accumulated experience, which is socially transmitted, or more briefly, behavior through social learning. Absolutely. Yes. That is what these whales do. Oh, it is through social learning. Of course. Yeah. So let me give you some evidence on that. Okay. So in captive settings, younger killer whales learn and use the calls of unrelated older tank mates. Okay. So there's some evidence of learned behavior because they're not saying it's genetic. You know, it's not like just genetic, you know, we, this is again the old nature versus nurture argument that right. you and I started, I don't know, 50, 80 pods ago. So second, research on, on mating patterns in this paper, I'm going to link it, um, cause it's just an amazing paper. I was, this is, I started, this is, you want to know why Angie, I, I went just crazy last night because when I was, or yesterday when I was doing my research and I was looking up evolution on killer whales specifically, and this is what came up and they were talking about the evolution of culture and learning. And I just was, my jaw hit the ground and I spent hours reading this stuff. It was just so amazing. It's incredible. So in the, the Northern or, or in the resident orcas that we talked about that are the Northern and Southern pods on mating patterns have shown all mating occurs outside the pod and most occurs outside the clan. Mm-hmm. Right. So they, they can actually communicate to each other, but only to the resident. They don't interact with, say, the the bigs or some of the other ones that we've talked about. They don't, they, they avoid each other like the plague. So there's just a lot of this evidence that they pass on this learning behavior and they've seen it, mom, like I said, in that hunting behavior, teaching, teaching the younger ones 
how to do that. Now we know other animals do that. Other species tend to show, but this is like clear evidence. And, and I think in killer whales probably, I mean, I, I haven't seen a lioness say, Hey, come here, junior. Let me show you how to run and jump on this gazelle. The, the younger lions watch mom right. do that. Whereas in the killer whale, they teach, they, they actually keep prey alive let the younger ones mess with it, play with it, learn how to deal with it. And I guess now I've seen lions do that too. I think sometimes. So when you're talking culture, they just, they just, the evidence, the unique dialects, the different clans have different, this dialects are similar, but they have like, what do, what do we call it? Like different accents. So, I just, I was, I fell out of my chair. I just was literally like, oh my goodness, this is one of the most amazing species I've ever studied. I know. And I, for this podcast. I didn't know about, uh, I'm not sure about, uh, killer whales, but a new, a recent study came out saying that, uh, with dolphins, I, I'm not sure exactly which species, but they actually have names. <laughs> so, okay. I mean, we know their brains yeah. are huge. I mean, they, they have massive brains. So, and by name, it, basically means you're, you know, this one's click, click, whistle or whistle, whistle, click or, or whistle, whistle, whistle. I don't know. I, well, I didn't read the paper yet, but. I well, it's your, your big bottom woman and, and big nose man and small pectoral fin James. Who knows? Probably. <laughs> That's what it means to them. <laughs> That's what it yeah. means. I don't know. So. Oh, it's, 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 that is the part. And uh, there's so much to study with all these animals, Angie. We, I just want to keep the pulse of that and see what other species we can think about and learn. And cause that evidence of culture is just such a huge can of worms and a huge question, but it's fascinating, it especially in your area of animal it behavior. It is. Well, and there's yeah. definitely books written about it. So we'll have to maybe try to find some good ones. I, I read some yeah. back in the day, yeah. but no, it is. It's just, it's just, it's just incredible. And you led me into a really good section as far as behavior goes, because we're going to talk a lot about their communication and what they do. But in general, as far as their activity goes, their range size or how far they travel or move around, that's more or less unknown in a lot of the different uh, mm -hmm. ecotypes. Mm -hmm. But they have been documented to swim up to 160 kilometers a day. And if you do have the ability to be out on a boat and able to actually watch the killer whale behavior, you'll learn that there is some amazing stuff that they do as far as movements. So we're talking everything from back dives to belly flops to breaching to burping. So that's a little above surface vocalization. Sounds like letting gas. <laughs> I can relate. <laughs> as I'm drinking my bubble water here, right? Uh, but there's yes, just, I yes. mean, a whole list of them. And uh, we'll, on our show notes, a fabulous group called the Center for Whale Research. And we'll be talking about them more at the end of the podcast. They have just a beautiful website and I'll put these behaviors up because there's like a list of 30 of them as far as uh, lunging mm -hmm. and slap, pectoral slaps and rolling and, uh, mm -hmm. fluke waves and play. So, and they have great pictures that go along with it too. It's so for lack of time, I can't go into all of them or what each one means, but, uh, I know Chris, you'll be out there with your clipboard here. <laughs> when I'm looking at blue whales. <laughs> and then if I watch a, a pod of killer whales come in, oh, leave yeah. the blue whale alone. Be like, oh my gosh, there's an inverted tail lob. I saw one. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, mark that off my list. <laughs> but they have they have tons of fun um uh they have uh tons of fun repro behaviors. And then Chris, if you're lucky enough, you'll see lots of prolonged behaviors that have to do with the pod. So there's feeding and circling, direction changes, lots of different ways to travel. There's porpoising that's traveling at high speeds. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Really, really cool stuff. We'll link that to the show notes. Um, and hopefully someday I will get to check all of those behaviors off my bucket list because I would love to see all of those in real time. Videos are amazing. Mm -hmm. I've been watching a lot of videos, but it's not quite the same, right? Mm -mm, mm -mm. And so one of the biggest parts of 
orca behavior is that they're highly social and that their social structure is very complex. Mm -hmm. And we'll learn a lot more about that as we move into communication here shortly in a second, I promise. But in general, these pods can, can contain anywhere from 10 to 30 or so, like the southern resident killer whales, the pods J, L, and K. So I guess there even has been reports of hundreds of individuals, but this was like an attempt. This is like different families hanging out for whatever reasons. But what happened, the pod family is basically made up of multiple generations of related in- individuals that have some mature males, some calves, mostly females and mostly immature males. And so in general, killer whales have limited dispersal from their maternal pod and young whales are always, always going to be in their mother's pod. And so if they're, if you're in a pod, you're usually close to them within a hundred meters of each other to coordinate all these activities like hunting and protection, things like that. And they share prey and they usually don't stray from the pod for more than a few hours. And of course, family members, pods, will teach through what they call apprenticeships. So as Chris highlighted earlier, it's not just like, oh, okay, here's one time watching me. It's actually an apprenticeship of learning, like hands-on learning. Yeah, like Uh uh, just hold on. Like seriously, (laughs) this is a whale. This is a dolphin, technically speaking, that apprenticeships. Let that sink in for yeah. a minute. Let's just don't brush that over like apprenticeships. That shows you how quote unquote cultured they are, how intelligent they are, how their social behaviors are. Like, holy, that is this stuff that we've discovered in the last 20, 30 years in, in all these animals has to change humanity's view on how, how we look at all these different species. It has to talk about, you know, Julie going back, telling me, be optimistic. This is the stuff that makes me optimistic. When we get this data out and we talk about these things, people have to know this. They have to know this. So they care going back to what you said in the very beginning, you know, of episode one, you were talking about, this is why I care. If you don't listen to this and care, which I mean, I know people do that are our fans that are listening, but still, this is the stuff that we have to get out to the public in the general eye. So when you have, um, biting my tongue, our politicians who go, Oh, it's a stupid whale. Who cares? Let's go drill or start doing sonic booms in the Puget sound area or it. Oh, anyways, I'll, I'll save it for another day. It just, this is why we all need to work together because that is Angie. That fact alone stuns me, stuns me when you really think about it. Well, stick with me, brother. I've got a few more. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to be I'm marching to DC tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> from I know. California. I'm, I'm not, I'm not done yet. But so speaking about, and we touched on it, I think in, uh, episode part one of this and maybe a little bit earlier today, but among these pods, they have different dialects. And what we mean dialects is with, so how do killer whales communicate? They communicate through Whistles, echolocation clicks, pulse calls, low frequency pops, and jaw claps. So they're generically divided into three groups of whistles, clicks, and discrete calls. Okay. These vocalizations are used both for navigation, especially echolocation and clicks, but are also used to communicate with each other. And Usually discrete calls and whistles are for communicating within their pod and to other pods. Each pod has a discrete dialect. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's just nuts. That's nuts. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's, that sounds slightly different from other pods and wait for it, Chris, wait yeah. for it. Okay. Okay. These dialects have been shown to stay the same in a pod for up to six generations. Ugh. I'm telling I'm telling you, it's just like, you know, 
Australians and, and the Brits and the Greeks and, you know, accents and, and that is seen in these whales. Like that's what, yes. uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. And now it gets, it gets even better. Okay. <laughs> so uh, a frequency of a killer whale whistle ranges from about 0.5 to 40 kilohertz with a peak energy of six to 12 kilohertz. Mm -hmm. Okay. So like you said, sound travels faster in the water and so they can hear each other and understand things. But what's super fascinating is this dialect and style varies among the different ecotypes mm -hmm. and not just for, because they're a different ecotype, but for really important and intelligent in relation to their feeding habits. Okay. So the use of echolocation is going to vary greatly between whether if they're a fish eating ecotype or a mammal eating ecotype. Mm -hmm. So for instance, in the North Pacific, the resident killer whales are more vocal and 27 times more likely to produce clicks. They call them click trains, mm -hmm. click trains for echolocation. Okay. This is totally different than the transient populations. And the difference is, is that the transients are eating more marine mammals, whereas the right. residents are more fish oriented. Right, right, right. And so right. it's like they know because marine mammals have like acute hearing. Yes. In the frequency range of these sonar clicks compared <laughs> to fish. So seriously, like an attempt to be like super stealth and go unnoticed. <laughs> <laughs> There's several studies that suggest, I, I'm not even, I can't make this stuff up. There's several studies that suggest that transient killer whales, you've pa used passive listening. They've learned to be good listeners to detect and locate marine mammals instead, instead of relying on their echolocation. Hey, okay. Remember, was it last week with koalas? You were trying to be this big Star Wars nerd. <laughs> You failed miserably. Yeah. Oh, it's <laughs> hilarious. It Chewbacca. Yeah. No, they're my Ewoks. husband would be so embarrassed. Yeah. <laughs> so this going back to being a Star Trek nerd, different uh, series. It was Star Trek for the movie where they bring whales to the John future. John and I play that. That's how he, that's how he trains me. We play, is this person from Star Wars okay. or Star Trek? Star Trek. And I get like most of them wrong. I, the, the whole thing was <laughs> these whales, Speak to this UFO, it, you know, dorky movie way back oh, when. Oh, you lost me I, now. I'm but out. <laughs> what planet are these animals from? Are they from here? Right. Like, ah, oh, I see where you're going with this. Yeah, it was. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Okay, keep yeah, amazing so, me. Okay. Yeah, I, I, and so basically, they're they know what they're hunting, and they don't, and they know they know the enemy, and they know how to sneak up on the enemy better and sometimes that's if it's a fish that doesn't really the clicks don't you know scare them away they mm -hmm. go for that if they need to be quiet they're quiet and then they do crazy stuff like the wave wash or the mm -hmm. karate chop or the blowhole block or all those other hunting moves and so right. just just it, but also when you talk about culture mm-hmm what that tells me, and, and I'm no expert, but the ability to adapt and change in order to stay on top is very humanesque, right? Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. It is. I, uh, you know, and I thought elephants were smart. Okay. And I don't know if humanesque is a word. I think I just made that up. But it's very human-like or shown of higher intelligence as far as, oh, okay, well, this doesn't work for these guys, so we'll just do this. Well, and what it's we like, always it's say. Like, it's the ability to rationalize, I suppose. Right. And we're always careful not to anthropomorphize animals, right? Like, oh, don't assign them human characteristics that, Correct. you know, that, that's what going back. And now I want to go back and argue with all my ex. <laughs> I want to go back and argue with all the other scientists that we used to always have these debates about that. Oh, you know, cause I, even on Instagram, I asked, do animals have feelings? And, and I used to teach this to my students and I'd be like, Oh, do animals have feelings? And they would laugh. Oh, of course not. And I said, really? You know, and we start going down the list, you know, do dogs show fear? Okay. Do they fear? Are they scared? 
you know, when you're angry at them or do they show love, you know, and and appreciation? Yeah. So all those things. So yeah, of course animals feel, but then you go down the list of, you know, what level do insects fear? I don't know. Do they? I'm not an insect expert, but you know what I mean? So now you're talking Mm -hmm. about probably, this is the one species we've covered so far that is the closest to us in brain activity, I would say. And we haven't, you know, we didn't really get too much into it in dolphins, I guess, the river dolphins and the porphyquita porpoise. But yeah, this is, this is the one species that has knocked me on my rear end the most behavior wise, like just, Wow. Well, that's okay. why we do this, Chris, day in, day out, every week, I know. fighting the good fight, man. Yep, and, yep, uh, yep. and hopefully, and like I said, hopefully some of our listeners, if you have learned some things and you want to share them and get other people excited about, Please. about, uh, orcas and why you should care about them, which means you should care about the oceans, right? Yes. Yeah, um, yeah. so, but yeah, and then switching gears a little bit as far as their reproduction, so what we do know about killer whales is they're not very loyal. <laughs> Both males and females have multiple <laughs> mates throughout a season or a lifetime. So maybe mm-hmm. they're like, oh, that, oh, that marriage thing that you humans do, forget about it. <laughs> well, they mean plus genetic diversity. So, okay. Good for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good for them. Yep. So, but when we talk about their life cycle and we talk about uh, infant, infant calf mortality mm-hmm. being around 50% according to some studies. Uh, in general, male orcas don't become fully sexually mature until they're about 25. Wow. So okay. that's wow, a really? long time. I that mean, they long? become, but they can't mate. Before, yeah. Right. There's, they won't win yes, the right exactly. to mate or something. Okay. Get it. Get it. Got Correct. It. Between the okay. ages of 12 and 15, their dorsal fin grows taller and straighter mm-hmm. and that helps indicate the onset of sexual maturity, okay. but they typically don't mate until after the age of 20. And then therefore they're not the big bad boy in town until mm-hmm. they're about 25. Mm-hmm. Okay. Got it. So with females, uh, it's similar, uh, female orcas really become mature around the age of 15. So, Kind of like crazy. Us. Kind of sounds yeah. like almost like humans, yeah. right? A little yeah. bit. Yeah. Um, and as far as different courtship behaviors and things like that, uh, there just needs to be more research. Uh, studying them is very difficult uh, for a lot of the different ecotypes, as Chris had right. previously pointed out. Yeah. And so we do know a fair amount about their cycle and gestation more from observing them under human care. And what, what we can garner is that females come into estrus several times during the year, uh, mating and that thus calving can take place year round. And when they've been under human care, it's been observed that uh, females will undergo multiple estrus cycles. So it's what we call polyesterous. Um, but they also experience periods of non-cycling. Okay. And, but once again, that's under human care. So it might differ mm-hmm. somewhat in the wild or depend, it might differ if they're living in the, near the Antarctic or near right. the Arctic. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. but what, what we can garner is that in general, females have about four ester cycles during this polyester period. And when they do become pregnant, gestation is about 15 to 18 months. So wow. that's yeah, long depending time. on probably the ecotype or from what we can, from what. Hey, there's something shown. elephants still win 22 months. Elephants, so elephants mm-hmm. still win something. I'm like, there's nothing. The elephants are better than killer whales. Except that that's not even oh, better. Yeah. It's two years being pregnant. <laughs> it's easy for me to yeah. say as a man. And well, some research shows that the breeding happens a lot in the summer, which that's pretty typical for a lot of species. Uh, and then therefore, if you do the math, a lot of killer whales are born in the fall. But once again, this is off based off of minimal studies. And so, yeah, they, they basically, the female will have an average birthing rate about once every five years. Wow. Okay. So wow. a female, although she may live longer than the male in a long time, we'll, get, mm-hmm. we'll talk here about the grandmas in a second. Mm-hmm. Uh, she finally produced three to five calves in her whole lifetime. Yeah. So when we talk about gro- yeah. when we talk about the uh, the southern resident killer whales, 
over there in the Seattle, Puget Sound, Washington area. Mm. Uh, it's going to take a while for that population to rebound. And that's mm-hmm. why these two births so far um, in 2019 have been such a huge boon for that population because it, mm-hmm. it, it really is very, very meaningful. Uh, mm-hmm. If a female, you know, if a sexually mature orca only has on average three to five calves in her lifetime, I mean, mm-hmm. it takes, it's going to take a while for uh, that population to rebound. Um, and that's if we do everything right to help them. Right. So, right. and if you, um, and if you're a little bit lost in pod, uh, in the first part of this pod, Chris and I talked a lot about, um, the different ecotypes, but one of the more famous ones here in the U S being, um, the, the, um, the Southern resident killer whale population right. and they're critically endangered, which is mm-hmm. why we should care about them and try to save those guys. And there's, and we'll, we'll talk more at the end of the podcast about um, groups that are really helping, trying to help them out and studying them and doing amazing things to help promote public awareness and uh, educate people and, and protect the species as well. And so a calf, a baby killer whale, will, will nurse for about a year. So that's a lot of maternal investment mm-hmm. before mm-hmm. weaning. And as Chris previously mentioned, the mama, mama killer whale, that's going to be my new, yeah, the like mama bear, yeah. um, the helicopter bomb. Uh, yeah. Killer whale <laughs> mom is, might be a new term too, because yeah. once again, I mean, she puts a lot of time and energy into that offspring. Um, she's going to teach her calf how to hunt. And oh, wow. she's going to teach the calf how to be social and how to hang out in the social network um, as far as getting along with all the different dynamics in the pod. And at this point, it's presumed, sorry, Chris, that the fathers don't really have a ton of paternal investment <laughs> after mating. They're defending the pod. I don't know. <laughs> we know nothing on some. So, so a calf is going to remain in its natal pod even after it's weaned for a long time after it becomes independent and it's getting its hunting skills up and social skills and things like that. What is super fascinating. Well, it's all fascinating. Who am I kidding here? I know. I know. But what I want to focus on here for the next minute or two and just generate some conversation about or get people thinking about Mm -hmm. is what I mentioned earlier at the beginning of the podcast about what do humans what or what do female humans shortfin pilot whales and killer whales all have in common yeah and just those right just those that we know about at this point now we you all have to, long hair obviously <laughs> uh, beautiful teeth i don't know we all we all like salmon <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> i love salmon uh, um narwhal not so much no, no, no thank you no um no chris we um all experience menopause, also known as senescence. How did what? Okay. No, mm-hmm. I That's I'm uh, I have never heard that in my life. You're the repro guy. Come on, you're the re- you've heard this. Oh uh, yeah, I haven't done any, any repro work outside. Well, of because you and I study horses, and we know that hor- mm-hmm. horses will continue. But to el- cycle. I mean, I've studied elephants. Elephants don't go into Forever. menopause. They don't. No. Um. Mm-mm. No, no hoofs, ungulates, no. or rhinos don't go through menopause. Well, and it goes oh. back to that the female killer whales only p- producing three to five calves in their wow. lifetime. Wow, wow. Because wow. around the age of 30, of 30 to 40. Holy. Uh oh. What? I'm knocking on 40's door here myself. Oh, Yikes. man. Uh, just kidding. I'm actually already 40. So <laughs> don't tell anybody. <laughs> It's, we're getting older. So I they go through me- that, do, I probably, they go I through probably put, shouldn't put that on national air. But yeah, so um, they stop cycling. Yes. Wow. Between 30 and 40. And they don't know a ton about it. Yeah. Uh, a lot of these studies, like I said, ta- yeah, um, it's hard. It's hard. You know, we're still learning or whatever. But yes, they're re- reproductive until about 40. And it's just fascinating because this just hasn't been documented in other species mm-hmm. besides humans. And then, of course, like I said, the short fin pilot whale. Right. Which wow. is one of the relatives. Wow. So, Chris, why do killer whales experience menopause? I mean, you t- yeah, I mean, aging and we talk about hormones. Conserving and, resources, right, hormones. Right. You know, as the body ages and changes as we get older. So, 
Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's it, it it's a in them like I'm. It's aging, is what I think. Right, but an elephant ages and lives yeah, just as long. But they're not Maybe from not some other planet. I mean, we know these came from some other planet and got dumped <laughs> off because <there's, laughs> Star Trek taught me that. <laughs> touche, okay. touche. So, well, no, well, one of the leading hypotheses is called the grandmother hypothesis. Mm-hmm. And this was proposed years ago back in 1966. And it basically suggests that these older females forego the option to bear more children, which is typically all animals want to do, mm-hmm. right? Keep breeding, yeah. Replacing mm-hmm. our genes, yeah. Uh, so they can support their existing ones. By helping their children and grandchildren survive and thrive, they basically ensure that their genes Carry on. get passed down through multiple generations. Right, right. And recently... In 2012, uh, Darren Croft at the University of Exeter. Ex- Exeter. I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong. Exeter. Exeter, yeah. yeah. And his collaborator, Ken Balcom, who I'll um, be talking about his group here shortly, they've been studying the southern resident killer whale population in the Pacific Northwest since the 1970s. And they think that they have, by plowing through lots of data, um, about male orca mortality if if it if it's lost its mother before his thirteenth birthday, he was three times more likely to die the next year. If she passed away and when he turned thirty, he was eight times more likely to die. Wow, but if mom goes through menopause, his chances of dying goes down. So he's the original mama's boy? You got it. He should be. Yes. He better take good care of her. Yeah. But no, it goes to shake. It, the data, at least in this population, was pretty clear that mothers help their sons well into adulthood. Adulthood, And I'm sure any mother with sons out there will be like, um, yeah. heck yeah. 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 They're lucky. Yeah, they would have made it to 30 without I, yeah, me. Yeah, my mama. Um, my mama for sure. Yeah. So, but, but, and of course this, this conversation is still being, is still being discussed and, um, and, and, and there's, you know, I'm sure some debate out there, but it kind of led me to the question of, well, okay, we, as we mentioned, well, well, how do they differ than elephants? Elephants live a long time. Elephants have these really important family groups. They've got the matriarch. Okay. And, you know, so what researchers think is that, Basically, as a female orca grows older, her pod becomes increasingly more full full of her own children and grandchildren. She's increasingly related to her neighbors and shares more of her genes with these neighbors. So it's really important for her to make sure these genes stay around. Where in elephants, you might find this interesting because you're an elephant guy. There's not quite as much uh, impetus, if you will, because elephant sons always leave the birth group to find new ones. Yeah, you know, they go bachelor groups or become you know, solo. Mm-hmm. So yeah. females become less related to their group mates over time. Mm-hmm. So in an elephant her the matriarch needs to keep her producing until yeah, babies, she dies. yeah she keeps she keeps producing yep yeah. that's one yeah so that's one theory kind of comparing your some of your your two favorite animals yeah, your I know. elephant's always been your favorite and the orca's your new, new uh second. new little competition yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 but just real i mean what's how f- fascinating is that chris it's just they, uh, it's incredible and we don't we don't know a ton about it i no. mean like you know i mean there's probably there's more that we'll give learn me a postdoc yeah. to figure it out somebody yeah <laughs> yeah okay. i yeah but there's still a lot a lot more work to be done but it just goes to show i mean and from an evolutionary point of view how important families are mm-hmm. how and how much sacrifice women <coughs> cassowary dads <laughs> yeah cassowary <laughs> yeah. dads me and rob lang are cassowary dads <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, yeah 
And there's a lot more really cool things, yeah. but for sta- for time's yeah. sake, we'll just put more notes on yeah. our show notes. I'm a sea dragon at. daddy, just so you know. I, uh, yeah. You are, for <laughs> sure. Okay. So conservation, we opened it up with the, on the first one that we just, they're data deficient. You know, their IUCN doesn't have enough data to make a an assessment yet. But what we do have is one study, it was actually in a book called Whales and Whaling, but uh, the the chapter on this, uh, Forney and Wade, I think it was out of UC Berkeley, their study, they assessed that there's at least 50,000 killer whales of all ecotypes. But they do note that it's probably higher because estimates aren't available for these large areas of the ocean in the Northern Hemisphere, South Pacific, South Atlantic, and Indian Ocean. They just, they can't do assessments out there. So that's the best number we have or what I could find on total killer whales and across all ecotypes. But of course, there's so many challenges. One, again, this is turning you into a conservation hero. We know the oceans are in peril. If you haven't heard our podcast before about this, uh, you know, or if you've been hiding under a rock the last couple of years, that in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, it's called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. It's about the twice the size of Texas, almost the size of Mexico. It uh, covers 1.6 million square kilometers. Uh, you know, it's, it's huge. They estimate there's more than 1.8 trillion pieces of plastic in that patch, measuring over 80,000 tons. And I'm going to give a shout out to a website. And I'm, again, and we're going to have a ton of links on our on these show notes. The Ocean Cleanup, it's fascinating. They estimate there's there's like five total large garbage patches in the ocean right now. It's just the, the Pacific one's the largest. But they go into how they're working to seek solutions to clean it up. And I know one of them failed miserably. This one that they're doing, they've learned. And so they're going out, they're, them and the engineers, you know, they're going out in the oceans trying to, to clean this up. But, you know, just really quickly, you know, before we jump to organizations, the conservation tip of the week, it, it's just you have to stop using single-use plastics. You have to. It is so hard. I know I know, I know. I've, I battle myself every day with this, but you have to make a conscious decision to change your habits. And, you know, things like straws saying, no, thank you. And I, I go crazy when I get a cup with a straw in it and I'm like, oh, I forgot to tell them, no, thank you. So we have to stop using single use plastics because a lot of this stuff from the United States to Asia to Africa to South America, you name it. That's getting dumped into the oceans. We have to do this. We have to clean up our oceans. Whales are, are washing up on shores dead. Sea turtles, all the lives in the oceans are suffering. So you listening to this right now can be a conservation hero and you can help killer whales by refusing to use single-use plastics. Don't forget your shopping bags when you go to the stores. Say no to straws. Just today I got a smoothie. I said no I still got a, uh, I hate to admit this. I still got a plastic cup, but I, I said no straw or, or top, please. You know, and I, what I need to do is buy the reusable one. And I thought about it on the way home today because I knew we were doing this podcast tonight. Yeah. We just I, keep them in our cars. I'm going to do that. Multiple ones. I'm going to buy it, you know, coffee cups, everything and bring my own. I'm going to make yeah. that, mm-hmm. that I go to commitment. Dunkin' Donuts all the time and I yeah. bring my stinky, dirty, reusable coffee cup, <laughs> but they, but they know me. They're cool. Yeah, I know. All right. So we will do that and we'll keep posting that organization. Who, who is the one we're going to talk about today? So today I've, I touched on it a little bit, uh, previously, but we're going to talk about the center for whale research. They can be found on Facebook, just, uh, search for center for whale research, or they can be found at www.whaleresearch.com. And the mission for the center of whale research or the CWR is basically dedicated to the study and observation of the Southern resident killer whale orca population in the Pacific Northwest. Once again, that ecotype, that population is critically endangered. Their numbers have been low for a long time and are around 76 individuals right now. Um, And they've had 76 or 77 Congratulations to them. They've had two births in 2019, one a few days ago, or one a few weeks ago, 
One just recently in May and then one earlier in January. And so the reason I highlight, want to highlight this organization, because there's a ton of groups, especially in the Pacific Northwest, that are doing a lot with education and conservation um, as far as this critically endangered population of orcas. But the Center for Whale Research really struck me because they've been doing this for 43 years. So we really need to get one of their scientists um, and to maybe try to get him on the pod if anybody can help us connect with them because it'd be just great to, I don't know, maybe they'll invite us out on the boat with them or something. (laughs) (laughs) But they've been doing this and yeah. And they're one of the leading organizations basically that studies this critical habitat. It's called the Salish Sea. I mentioned him recently in one of the studies about menopause, but so Ken Balcom, he's been there for years. He says, I am not going to count them to zero at least not quietly. So the Center for Whale Research is a great nonprofit organization and they are critical for helping NGOs and government officials make informed decisions about what type of ecosystem is required to ensure that these guys can live in a healthy, happy environment. And because of all the research they've been doing for so many years, they're the go-to experts for both U.S. and Canadian government officials. And they have meetings and collaborate on ideas Mm -hmm. and try to figure out what's in the best interest of the orca population there in the Pacific Northwest. And besides working across the aisle with uh, government officials, which I can't even imagine how challenging that might be, but they collect a lot of data. And Chris and I are an evidence-based podcast. We love, we love science and um, the process of scientific data and going through it. And so the center for whale research does annual orca surveys. They know the individuals Mm -hmm. they've been following them. That's how they know when there's births and other issues going on. And they, document things, of course, as far as their behavior, the ecology, their prey, their social behaviors, their foraging pattern behaviors, what they're eating, how much, all of this. So very, very critical. And they recently opened the Orca Survey Outreach and Education Center. And that is on San Juan Island and off of the coast of the state of Washington. And it's a center dedicated to educating people about orca conservation and biology. So they have a ton of their websites, gorgeous. They have, they have a ton of ways to help the, the person like myself, how we can best take action, um, as far as signing petitions online, connecting online, which is what our group, uh, all creatures mm-hmm. podcast does speaking out education. And then of course you can donate to their cause because all of their money goes back into their research of the um, Southern resident killer whale population. So check them out, w- uh, www.whaleresearch.com or like them on Facebook and follow them to learn more about the amazing group. Yep. Good group. Just to, uh, we started this with part one now in part two, where the name killer whale comes from. I, I think most people know there has never been an incident of a, wild orca killing a human in the oceans that that has never been documented where this came from was long time ago. Sailors saw these killer whales killing other whales and they called them whale killers. And eventually that nickname became killer whale. And in Spanish they're called Balina Asesina. I hope I said that right. You speak Spanish better than I do. <laughs> I do. I, I I have to have the words in front of me. If you flip your Balina, Balina, Balina. There you go. Assassin whale. Balina Assassina. <laughs> That's your new name. So for us, you know, please check us out on Patreon again. From the part one, we we had to release this to the public. We couldn't paywall this episode. Uh, but if you can support us $5 a month, we will love you. And, and you know, we, we do appreciate it. We appreciate the support and love at the minimum. If you could share this episode with your friends, be like, you need to listen to this, that 
would make us very happy. You can follow us on Instagram, All Creatures Podcast. Check us out on Facebook or Facebook group. Having some good discussions there. Thank you. Two weeks of amazing, oh, just amazing, amazing species, Angie. I, I, we're going to have, it's going to be hard to top this one. I know. I actually want to go read more about them right now. <laughs> So, <laughs> but yeah, check out right, the show we'll notes. We'll put some, put some fun videos up there and yes, um, just keep listening, keep sharing, keeping a conservation hero. Know that we appreciate your time and your energy and all the feedback has been incredible. Uh, and do me a personal favor. If this is, uh, if you haven't already and please rate us on iTunes, yes, unless you're yes, going to give us a you. bad rating, then don't. Yeah, just five stars. That's it. <laughs> All right. Take care. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Bye, Chris. Listen, learn, share. Join the movement at allcreaturespod.com. <laughs>